I'm a uh, farmer from Nebraska. I farm up in the northeast part of Nebraska. Um, I'm about 90 miles from the South Dakota border and 90 miles from the Iowa border, kind of up in the corner of Nebraska. Um, I started down the organic trail a little bit different than most people. Um, I was a dairy farmer before, uh, farming conventionally. And um, in 2006, um, I decided I was going to use Roundup corn. And so I planted the Roundup corn, sprayed it, got by really good that year. The next year, I planted my Roundup corn again, uh, sprayed it. 45 minutes after I got done spraying, it rained. So I got very poor weed control. Come back about eight days later, sprayed it again. Guess what? One lone cloud comes across the sky, wipes the Roundup off my uh, uh, corn again. So I go out there, spray it again. That fall, we go out and um, I always cut part of my uh, corn for silage and we bagged it and made two big nine, uh, 250 foot bags. And then we also uh, snap part of it and make earlage out of it. And so a third of the field got chopped for silage, the other two thirds was uh, we made earlage out of it. About uh, four or five days before Christmas, I had a cow calved, brought her down to the milk parlor. Uh, a day later, she comes in wobbling into the milk parlor and falls down. And we're like, uh, what do we do now? Well, we got the cow up, got her out of the barn. 24 hours later, she was dead. And uh, so two days later, I have another cow, goes down. We get her up. She seems to be all right. She dies. Then on Christmas morning, I got a real good present. I had a cow, was given 130 pounds a day. I go out in the barn, she's frothing at the mouth. Um, is in respiratory distress, and my wife says, we have to find out what's going on. We have to call the vet. You can't just keep going on. So we call the vet. He says, we might as well put this cow down. So we put the 130 pound, cow, pound day a cow down open her up and she's got these lesions all over her lungs. And he says, you got something in your feed. And I said, well, I tested for nitrates. He said, no, no, no. He says, it's mycotoxins. And I'm like, myco what? Never heard of it. He says, you have to find a lab that can test for mycotoxins. So in the meantime, while I was waiting for the lab results to come back, I go out to the field and put my electric fence in to let the heifers run out on the cornfield. The stalks are all black. And I'm like, this is kind of weird. But put the fence up and we get the results back and we have Fusarium bacteria that poisoned the cows. We test the corn, it's at uh, four to eight parts and anything over two parts on uh, Fusarium bacteria is toxic to animals. So this silage is way over. The ear corn is about three parts, so it's usable and the corn silage we cut in half to what we was feeding and started feeding more alfalfa hay in our ration to utilize what we had. Um, we kept going and kept losing cows and kept cutting down on how much we was feeding and finally one day my wife says either sell the cows or quit feeding that silage and I'm like I can't sell the cows. We'd lost 15 cows at this point and so we uh, quit feeding the silage and I had a bag of silage that I never fed. We ended up taking a knife and going down the top of it and just letting it rot away. Ten years later it finally dissipated. So then um, about four years after that my wife uh, ended up having breast cancer. And so we did the normal treatment with radiation and normal chemo. And uh, it came back. And so she said we're going to do alternative. So we went to Reno, Nevada and saw the same doctor that saw Suzanne Summers. And he says, the only way that you got a chance is to go to organic food. Well, at that time, I pretty much went back to all conventional crops using one dose of spray and then cultivating. And I decided at that time, if it was good for my wife, I'm gonna go to organic. So I started transitioning at that point. And um, had to learn, but I wasn't like most of your conventional farmers that if you see a weed out there, it's a total crime. I was used to uh, farming with just a one shot of chemical. If I had some weeds, it was no big deal. 
And uh, so then I decided to go with the organic system. My first year, I just used a disc. And um, the disc kind of did a decent job, and we double disced it. And then I had an Einbach tine weeder that I got to use as a, for my blind cultivation and to tine weed with when the weeds are at that small white root stage. And all we had was a giant rake. Um, the weeds or the stalks wouldn't go through the tine weeder, and so I had to figure out a different system. So the next year we went to the trees and found an old plow. And we plowed everything that we was going to plant in corn and soybeans. And it worked, but not quite as good as what we was hoping. So then I decided to get a plow from Europe because the Europeans have been doing this for years, and so I got a Lemkin plow. And Wrong slide. It's not going. I'm going too fast. There we go. Okay. This here's my plow. Um, I was plowing uh, my uh, fall corn, and then I come back and uh, come back in and uh, drill the, the rye into that. Here I'm drilling my rye into the um, cornfield. Um, I'll go back here and back up to where I started. Okay, we center pivot irrigate everything on my farm. I have three center pivots and I windshield wiper all my farms. I have uh, tree belts in the middle and so none of my pivots go completely around. This particular pivot here is behind my house, and uh, I dropped this, the last three towers off of this pivot. And so it can, I drop the last three towers, run it behind my house, and I gain an extra about 12 acres. On top of this pivot is an end gun, so I turn that big end gun on, and it will water that area. Also, there's a uh, controller on there. I don't think we can see it, there's a uh, radio controller. All of my pivots are controlled with my cell phone. So I can change the speed of my, my pivots at any time. I know exactly where they're at with an app that I got on my phone. If I want to change the, the speed of the pivots, I can change it. Also, I can control the end guns. And I have uh, one pivot that goes along a public road. And so when that pivot comes up there, I can check to see that that end gun is shut off. Because we have a, uh, it's a thousand dollar fine if you water the public road. And so I make sure that that end gun shuts off. And by doing that with that controller, I can check on my phone and see where those pivots are at at any time during the day or night. Uh, this is one of my grain bins. Um, this was this harvest. We was dumping the corn in there and, and unloading it into the, the bin there. This cornfield right here, um, you can see how clean it is. Um, I did a uh, uh, blind uh, cultivation, which has been talked about. I did two types of blind cultivation on this field. Normally when I plow it, I uh, come back in about 24 to 36 hours try to plant. This year we had too much moisture, couldn't get back in there to plant. So what we did was took a uh, spike harrow and before we planted, run the spike harrow drag over it, planted. The next morning after planting, we went in with the Einbach tine weeder and we run it again. And we blind cultivated it twice. And as you can see, there's very little wheat uh, pressure in this field. I ended up cultivating twice. I have a buffalo uh, high residue cultivator. And the first time I set my uh, barring off disc to throw it to the middle. Then the next time when the corn's usually about waist high, I run it the last time and I throw it to the row to cover up anything that's in the row. This particular corn at this uh, spot when we was going through the combine was hitting 215 on the monitor. And everybody when I went to organic says, ugh, you can't get the yields. Well, they're wrong. If you can get that ground clean, you can get all kinds of yields. And that's the biggest thing is you've got to keep that corn clean Got to keep that beans clean in that first two weeks. That's the critical time period. And usually what I do is I tine weed everything, usually every three to five days. 
and keep hitting it, keep working that top inch and a half of soil. The tine winter I got has got a set of uh, wheels on the back of it. It's called a, an Einbach Exact. And so it follows the contour of the ground. I have rolling ground where I'm at. Most of the tine weeders don't have the set of, of wheels behind, so it doesn't follow the contour of the ground near as well. I actually had the very first one in North America and got it in a crate and had to put it together. Um, my two sons are both engineers for Agco and one of them was there so he helped me put it together and we had no issues putting it together because he had all the training. But uh, it works really well and I also use it in my alfalfa. Um, last year I did a trial, took 20 acres and I time winded it before, just when it broke uh, dormancy in the spring, then after ever cutting. And that field was just about as clean as the conventional ones when you used to spray them. So it, it's a, a tool that can be used on, on multiple crops. And speed and, and the pressure that you set it makes a, a big difference. When we do our blind cultivation, we're usually running about five mile an hour. When we come back to do our um, uh, tying weeding after the crop has come up, we'll slow down and usually run about three mile an hour. The one I got is a 21 meter, so it covers 16, 30 inch rows. So it covers the ground fast. And um, the tine weeder is a big part of, of my weed control system. And uh, I have used it on corn that was a uh, foot tall, and it doesn't seem to, to knock it out. We do add about 2,000 plants per acre when on our uh, planting population to account for the um, amount of crop that's going to be destroyed by the, the tine weeder. Because it will knock some out. Uh, don't let anybody tell you that it won't. It, it does knock some of the population out. I usually plant about 24,000 on my corn. And uh, soybeans, I usually plant about 120,000 is what I usually for, uh, shoot for my uh, planting population. My buffer. Uh, corn, I have a different use than what most people do. I have a corn burning furnace and so instead of taking that crop to town and selling it, I run it through my furnace and heat my house with it. And so to make sure that I did everything right, I took my buffer corn. I have a scale that's uh, certified just two miles away so I just hauled my buffer corn over there, run it across the scale and certified my bushels. This uh, furnace, I have a small house. My house is 4,500 square feet. This furnace takes two bushels a day when it's really cold out like this and we'll keep that house at 70 degrees. It's very efficient. And um, the, uh, all that's left usually is the hearts and I can go about two weeks before I have to clean my uh, furnace out. Uh, clean the, the fines out from when it's burning. But it, it does an excellent job. Um, we also have, most of my ground is in uh, hay production. I have um, uh, about 300 acres of my 440 acres that's normally in hay production. And um, I've always loved the, the hay part of it. Um, I started putting hay up 50 years ago. And most of you look at me and like, uh, you're not that old. Um, I started putting hay up that's when I was seven. Uh, my dad was uh, facing surgery. He had to have a colostomy and he couldn't lift anything. And so my grandpa says, well, son, it's time to go cut hay. And I'm like, grandpa, I don't know how to run the windrower. He says, come on, I'll show you. So we had the old 275 International Windrower, 14 foot head. Well, back then that was a big windrower. And uh, we went out and we made two rounds and he says, okay, you know how to do it. And I'm like, sure, grandpa. I said, can I come and find you if I got trouble? And he says, well, yeah, I'll be over in another field over here. You can come and find me. And I got along really good, and so we got done uh, cutting it. Two days later, he comes back. He says, you know where the side delivery rake's at? And I said, well, yeah, it's sitting back there. And I said, well, let's go get hooked on. So we went out, and we started raking. Got done with that. We chopped everything, and we blew it in a harvest store. And so Grandpa says, oh, you know what the next job is? I said, yeah, we got to go hook on the chopper. And we threw two 14-foot uh, windrows together. I had a big uh, 5,000 Ford tractor on the front of that chopper. Well, we got a windrow that's just about as wide as the head. 
And Grandpa says, um, how are you going to get onto the clutch here, son? And I said, well, I guess I'll slide off the seat to stop the tractor. So that's the way I chopped. I'd go 10 feet, let it go through the machine, take off. And that's where I did first cutting hay. Second cutting was a breeze because you didn't have all that volume, but I started chopping hay and when I was in uh, seven back in 1967. And uh, we've been putting hay up again uh, since then. And um, I put up, uh, I'd like to know how big a pile of feed I've put up. Because it was always my job. We run about 400 head of cattle. And it was my job to chop all the feed, whether it be hay, silage, oatage, whatever it was, I chopped all the feed. And um, over the years, I've wore four pull type choppers out and two self propelled And so the amount of feed I've chopped is, is a huge pile. But I love the forage part of the business. And basically, I use the uh, corn and soybeans as a rotation crop. Um, the alfalfa is usually in the ground four to six years. I plow it up with uh, my Lemkin plow. This here is one of the, my Lemkin plow here, uh, plow, and it's a big rollover plow. It's 822s. And uh, it's, uh, here we're running down through the cornfield here. I'm actually pulling this plow at a seven and a half mile an hour. And now you're saying, okay, what kind of a horse have you got on the front of this? I have a 380 horse Massey tractor pulling this, takes 17 gallons of fuel an hour, but I'm doing 12 acres an hour. So you take the fuel usage and one pass, I'm done, I'm ready to plant, unless I have to come in and, and uh, knock those weeds out before. But it takes no time to to cover a field. I can do 75 acres in a day real easy with this plow. Um, I also have a 20 foot drill that I drill my alfalfa with. It's on six inch centers. And the six inch centers really help on weed control. Usually what I do is plant an oats cover crop, let the oats get two to three inches tall, then I come back in and drill the alfalfa into the, the oat stand. The reason I do that is we've got re really light soil. I got sand. And if I plant the alfalfa by itself, the sand will cut it off because we get the, the winds and pretty soon you got no stand left. So let the, the oats take the beating, then come back in and plant the alfalfa into it. Usually I plant about 16 to 17 pounds of alfalfa with three quarters of a pound, uh, bushel of oats for my cover crop. So I don't plant the oats real thick but it's just enough to slow the, the wind down so that I don't have the soil erosion and it saves my alfalfa. Here I'm drilling the, the rye into the um, corn field that I plowed earlier. Then I'm gonna come back this next spring, let the rye get up probably a foot, foot and a half tall. I'll come in with a plow and I'll plow that down as a, a green manure for my soybean crop. This is a new experiment for me. We're gonna see how it works. I've never done it this way before, but I think um, the uh, nitrogen and calcium ratio that I'm gonna get out of the rye is gonna really benefit this, this soybean crop. Um, my soybeans this last year, I averaged 68 bushel. And most of everybody around me was getting 45 to 50 on conventional with farming out of the jug. And everybody's like, how in the world did you get that kind of production? And I'm like, my soil is balanced. And someone was just talking about how the weeds will balance. I have a book, Weeds and Why They Grow. And uh, first, I didn't under, understand the correlation. But you have to let those weeds go through, do their seed production. Once they've done their seed production, they've done their job. They've pulled out all the nutrients. They've rebalanced it. It goes back into the ground. And now you've got that soil balanced for that weed. Is that weed gonna give you trouble now? No, that one's gonna be out of the picture. Last year I put Humate on, and I'd, I'd done some Humate before, but I never put on the amount that I did last year. I always had trouble with uh, mare's tail in my alfalfa. We had absolutely no mare's tail. The mare's tail did not like the environment that we put out there with Humate. There was enough carbon in there, I think, that we changed the carbon to nitrogen ratio. All of a sudden the mare's tail is in an environment it does not like. And all weeds have an environment that they love to be in. Once we figure out what that environment is, we can battle those weeds without any chemicals, without any uh, mechanical, anything. 
It's just to get that balance, and that balance is tough to find. But each weed has a function. The Lord made them have a function. And everybody thinks that they got to kill them before they get their function done. And where I found that out was when I was transitioning. I had a field of uh, soybeans that I planted, 35 acres. And it was uh, spring that my wife found out she had breast cancer, so I had a lot of things on my mind. I was uh, taking care of my cows, taking care of my wife, and there wasn't enough time to do the farming part. So I had nothing but a weed mass out there, and I had weeds this tall, and you couldn't find the soybeans by the time it was time to cultivate the second time, and I made two rounds, and I'm like, this is a joke. So I quit, went home, parked the cultivator, and figured, well, we'll combine the beans and see what's out there. 35 acres, I got 300 bushel of soybeans off that 35 acres. The next spring, I worked the ground, planted my oats in there, planted my alfalfa. I got the most beautiful stand of alfalfa I'd had on there in 40 years because those weeds did their balancing job. And we had mare's tail, we had uh, uh, fox tail, we had uh, lamb's quarter, and all that stuff was out there, but it all went to seed. Once it went to seed, it done its job, that ground was balanced, away we went. And that field has produced more hay than I've ever produced off of that field. But the balancing of the weeds that will do, people got to work with it. And until you go into the organic side of it, you never see that. When you're farming out of the jug, oh, we just kill them. And when you kill them in midstream, they haven't done their job. So that's a problem that the other part of the uh, population does not understand. We as organic farmers understand what a weed will actually help us in some situations more than it hurts us if we let it go to seed. Um, I think this is a video too. Maybe not. Yeah. Here I'm plowing with my tractor and rolling the uh, cornfield over or no, that's the alfalfa in the spring as I was before I was planting the, the corn. But see the beautiful job it does when it's laying it over that, that soil is crumbled. This plow has um, two lays on it. It has a mini lay and then it runs the, the regular lay, but it's an open lay. It's not a, a closed lay. So the soil comes off, crumbles, and then the mini lay, what it does, it stands the roots straight up and down. So now your moisture, your decomposers can follow that stem up and down and I think that's a big part to what this plow has done for my tillage system because the decomposers can go down there, break that alfalfa down. I usually let the alfalfa get a foot and a half tall before I, I plow it under. This last spring I had to wait and wait and wait because it was so dang cold and uh, I didn't plow until the 25th of May. Yes? How deep do you put the soil? Right here I'm working seven inches deep. So what I'm doing is I'm taking five inches of aerobic soil, rolling it under, bringing two inches of anaerobic soil up on top. Do weeds grow in anaerobic soil? No. So I got about two weeks that we don't have a lot of weed growth, and then we plant the corn and soybeans at that two inch level. So they're down there in the, anaer or in the aerobic soil. They can come up through, and we don't have to fight near the weeds that we did before. And with the tine weeder, we got no trash on top, it's a clean, beautiful field. As you can see, there's, there's nothing left there. It's just, and it buries all the trash. In my part of the country, everybody's like, well, how do you f farm with the government program? Because you've got highly erodible ground. So, well, folks, it's like this. I haven't used any government program since 2004. I'm not worried about them slapping my hand. And uh, my ground doesn't blow a lot. Um, I, I went this way because of what I saw in Europe on the videos, how clean the ground was, and um, it works excellent with the, my system. But uh, it's not gonna work for everybody. The reason I went with this size of plow was um, the, when I pulled the plow out of the trees, it was an 816. So I thought, well, 822s, I can pull that with a 254 horse tractor. Guess what? I went out there four and a half mile an hour as fast as I could pull that plow. This is a speed plow. It's made to be pulled at seven and a half to eight mile an hour. And with that, I had to have more horsepower. So, went to the implement dealer and I, for the first time ever, I leased a tractor. And I never dreamt I'd have a 300 horse tractor. Actually, the 320 horse that it came with wasn't enough. 
I actually had a guy from Czechoslovakia come and he turned that tractor up. It's pulling at 380 horse now. But I can pull that plow at seven and a half to eight mile an hour and that's where it's designed to be pulled. And it does an awesome job. We're running RTK um, on this tractor because uh, you have to be within two inches. So that dead furrow is filled perfectly every time. And I tried to run uh, Omnistar and it just wasn't close enough. And uh, so then I stepped up and, and started running RTK. Before that, I'd been using GPS since about 2002. Um, I got my first uh, steering system in 2003. So I've been around GPS for a long time. I use the same unit that I use on the tractor on my disc mower. And I cut hay at 17 and a half mile an hour. And uh, we're running two inches all day long. And I can, with that disc mower, I can cut 300 acres in a day. So I cover a lot of ground. My drill, um, usually I uh, do a lot of custom drilling. And everybody wants me to drill their alfalfa because it's on the six inch centers. So usually in the spring I have 1,000 to 1,200 acres that I drill. And I use this tractor, it runs 33 mile an hour down the road. So I can get from point A to point B real quick. And um, it's nothing for me to run 25 hours to get a, a couple of quarters done. Uh, last spring I ran 32 hours. The neighbor did come drive for five hours so that I got a five hour break, but we did two quarters in 32 hours with this drill. So you can cover a lot of ground if you keep at it. And uh, everybody says, well, you run a lot of hours. And my children are like, Dad, you gotta quit doing this someday. And I said, well, I haven't found someday yet. Um, I've always run a lot of hours. When I milk cows, most of the time I farmed at night. And uh, while everybody else was sleeping, I was doing all the other farming. Now at least with the cows gone, I can farm in the daylight. But uh, I still love the, the hay part of it. And uh, you gotta have the equipment to get the job done. And this, this here is, is one piece that's really helped my operation clean up the weed problem, is the plow and then the, the Einbach tine weeder. And between the two, I can cover a lot of ground in, in a short amount of time. I think I got a couple more slides left here, Brandon. Okay, no, that's it. Uh, any questions? Yes. So, so Randy, you're plowing your plow the ground. You're wor are you worried about running out of moisture when the seed germinates? If you plant right after plowing, right? Are you running water on it? If I have to, I have that option. Can you run water on the ground that's been freshly plowed and not create a crust? Yes, because I'm sand. We've got different soils. Yes, I've got sand. Um, my my profile of my uh, soil is I've got sand on top about three le three feet and then I got a clay layer underneath. So it works awesome for putting alfalfa up. I can have an inch of rain today, and tomorrow I can go out there with my disc mower and lay the alfalfa down, and I'm on dry soil. And so we do have to have irrigation to make a go of it, and um, water for me is, is no problem. We have, uh, we're pulling water from 80 feet, 1,000 gallons a minute. And I actually run two pivots off of one well, I've got uh, a T, and I can run three quarters of an inch in three days, flip my T, run three quarters of an inch on the other pivot, flip it back. 2012, when it was ugly, dry, I kept up with that uh, one well on two pivots. But we're pumping 1,000 gallons a minute, 24 hours a day, and uh, we can keep up. But the pivots, um, I use the pivots also to put uh, um, part of my fertilizer on, I use uh, the liquid fish and sugar. And when I got uh, weevils in my alfalfa, I just put a couple pounds of sugar to the acre, to the pivot, and just quick swing across seven hours, I can do a half a circle. And uh, so that's what I use to, to control the weevils. Same way with the western bean cutworms and the corn borers. I just uh, mix up uh, sugar and fish, pump it through my pivot, and knock them guys out. Aphids in the uh, 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 soybeans, you can do the same thing. A couple pounds of sugar to the acre, but I've got the perfect delivery system. I got the center pivot. And in seven hours, I can cover 65 acres. So at night, when it's perfect to put it on, that's when I do it. And I mix up a tank full. I got a 500 gallon tank with agitation on it. I just hook it up and pump it into the, the pivot and it's on. 
and it's delivered. I have to do nothing else. So it makes for, everybody got to use the tools you got. And uh, I've worked with the pivots since 1970. We put our first center pivot in in 1970. So we've been irrigating with center pivots for a long time. Any other questions? Yes. 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 Oh yeah, it's, it's loose. But we go right back in with the planter and just plant right over the top. I have looked at, at maybe using a roller to pack the ground, but my fear is there. Every time you pack ground, what do you do? You enhance the wheat production. So I feel I'm better off to, to leave it a little bit on the looser side and come back in and, and run right across. But yeah, it, that plow, it, it loosens it up. There's no doubt about it. You go out there and you're, your foot's going to sink in this deep. When I, that's the reason I drill the, alf, the oats in first on my plow ground is let the, the ground firm up. And a lot of times I'll go across with a pivot and I'll water the head of planting the alfalfa because I can come across with the water, put on a half an inch, and um, let it set for four hours, and then I go drill. Because it won't stick to my drill because it's sand. But, uh, the sand is, is uh, a problem for some plays, and, and if you learn how to farm with it, um, it it's uh, an awesome soil to work with, especially forages. Because you can go out there and you can do a lot of things that nobody else can. That's the main trick. Uh, one thing I, I did figure out was you want to keep that plow at a consistent level. Um, with this plow, you can set the, uh, the depth with the three point and with your, uh, the cylinder that rolls it over. And if you're daydreaming and don't get the plow set all the way down. I had some strips in my soybeans last year and I didn't have it, uh, the three point down because when I come up to the end, I pick the three point up as well as pick up the uh, the rollover and when I turned around I didn't put the three point back down I just rolled it down and so I was only plowing it about four inches deep and I had this streak of foxtail through the field the width of the plow and I couldn't figure out what it was until later that uh, summer my cousin was driving by and he said what's the deal with your field there he said you got strips the width of the plow and I'm like you are right that's where I didn't have it down in a couple of places and so it does make a difference on your depth, uh, uh, how deep you're plowing. No, we haven't found anything there. It, we just roll it under, and as long as we're at that seven inch dip, it, it gets it down. And this thing, we've rolled rye that was five feet tall. I rolled it under, and there was nothing left on top of this plow. So it, it's a crazy machine that uh, really does a, an excellent job. Um, but I had to go to Europe to get it. Um, the plows here in, in the U.S. won't do what this plow will do. So, Jeff? Yeah.